All right, we're ready to get started. Uh, this is Hinnick, and he's going to be talking about how to write development-friendly applications. There will be no Q&A after the talk. If you'd like to chat with uh, Hinnick, he'll be available for an open space or outside after the talk. Give a warm welcome to Hinnick. <clears throat> All right, thanks for coming everyone. I'm Hinek. You may know me from today's amazing keynote by Ying. There were my two seconds of fame. That also made me want to just throw away my slides. I mean, how does one do such great slides? <laughs> anyway, uh, I got a juicy head cold, so I hope I will not lose too much time to clearing my throat and I apologize ahead of time. All right, so my goal for today is to make your life easier easier by doing less. I want you to stop worrying about a lot of things in your applications, to be precise. So in a way, this talk is less about teaching you uh, fundamentally new th stuff and more about convincing you to stop doing things and maybe dropping some uh, bad habits. So I want you to stop worrying about where your lo logs go to and how they are processed, where your configuration is coming from and how it's structured and most importantly, where your application is running and how it got there. Instead, I want to, you to start thinking of how to make your application um, nicer to play with others. Because those tasks, they don't vanish. Someone still has to do them. But if your application stops being a Python Django application that serves cat pictures and starts being a universal building block with a consistent interface, others can do that work. So you can outsource complexity that is not uh, an inherent part of the value of your application. So we are going to create a lot of SEPs, someone else's problems tonight. <laughs> and uh, as a side effect, by the, by the end, your app will also be web scale by accident, which is kind of nice. So as with actual building blocks, it doesn't really matter whether you'll be building dog houses or airports. Your application should look the same on your laptop and in some huge cluster that's spanning the world. And it dramatically simplifies development, testing, operations, scaling, and moving to new platforms. And platform agility is a bigger deal than you may think right now because every infrastructure evolves unless it goes extinct. So yes, you will have to touch that CentOS 5 server eventually. And even if you're super happy with your state-of-the-art Kubernetes cluster today, I'm going to bet good money that in five years, there's going to be a good business model to move you off this legacy tech debt. So how do we get there and what exactly do we gain? So I'm going to show you with a very, very simple web application. But before you start leaving the room, this talk is not specific to web applications at all. It's just the easiest to talk about. And I will point out like differences and how it relates to other kinds of applications. And while I'm talking meta, as with every of my talks, I have compiled a page with all the links and concepts and my slides that I'll be talking about. So you can study it at your own pace and can keep your notes light. But now, behold our application. This is a very exciting pyramid view, as you may have noticed by the imports. And the only reason this slide exists is so I don't have to tell you to imagine a simple web view. So this is it. We have some, something concrete to talk about. And now, if you want to expose it to the world, to greet it, we need to create a whiskey application. How you do that depends on your framework. Uh, this is how it looks in Pyramid. And it's usually some kind of function that uh, in the end returns a whiskey app for you. And that can be passed into a whiskey container or into a test framework that allows you to drive fake requests against your application. Now this initialization code is notoriously hard to test. So the goal should be to keep this code as simple with as few branches between test, dev, and prod as possible. And the irony is that to be truly operations and deployment friendly, this code also has to be super robust. So for example, if you're starting up and you need a resource and resource is missing, you should try again with the back off and not say deadlock. Because um, making operations kindergarten your app uh, into production is the shortest way on, on their naughty list. Uh, that's not a, not a place you want to be. Now, 
This principle is, of course, not specific to web or whiskey at all. So you always want to isolate the creation of the objects of your application somewhere. Uh, so you wire it up based on information that is coming from the outside, such that the rest of your application can become just a bunch of classes and functions that you pass, uh, that you pass normal um, arguments. And that makes them easy to test. Then you, then you can start doing unit tests. Now in Pyramid, it works like this. You build a configuration object. Um, you uh, add your routes, you add middlewares, which I've omitted here. And by the end, you call make whiskey app, which then just takes all this information and creates a whiskey app. And a whiskey app is usually just a, just a callable. Now, at this point, we can uh, use a whiskey server. I'm gonna use GeoNicorn, because it's quite popular. And GeoNicorn also allows us to call a function and a definition, which we will do here for simplicity. And it comes up, and we can curl it, and we even get a log entry in Apache format. Now, now uh, it uh, the first interesting part comes, and uh, if you want to de deploy this to a server, you could just take the, the command line as it is, but it's the first, first thing you should be wary of, because then the cho choice of your whiskey container and the options you're passing into it bleed into the configuration of, uh, the pr of your process manager or of your cluster manager. So if you at some point want to change your whiskey uh, server, say to, uh, to micro whiskey or uh, to mod whiskey, uh, you have to change both at once. You, uh, because uh, in order to use that server, you have to have it as part of your application. So this is not great. You can run into problems very fast. And once you have to coordinate multiple parts at once, it's, uh, it leads to problems. So let's zoom out. What we want here is a building block. We want a standardized way to start application no matter what technology is inside. And it could be C++ for all we know. So um, how do we do that? Um, just like our ancestors in the 1970s, we write a shell script. <laughs> and this shell script is checked in along with our application. So it means that the way your application is started and the dependencies that can be used within the script are part of the same repository, so one repo uh, and a single point of truth. You can call it whatever you want. In Dockerland, it's common to call it docker-entrypoint.sh. I'm just gonna call it runapp.sh because it's literally what it does and it's short for my slides. Now, this exec is very important because it makes uh, the shell process be replaced with your own process, which is essential if you want to receive uh, signals, which you do. And this will redirect your uh, your standard error output to standard out, such that you have only one output stream, which is easier to handle. Now this way, your shell script becomes kind of an adapter between your application and your environment. And this works in systemd, in Docker, or in proc files, which you can use with uh, applications like Foreman, Forgo, or Honcho, and is quite popular with platform as a service providers like Heroku. Now, what do we have? We have our black box, which is a building block that is very easy to run. Just run a sh shell script, and it serves on local host, and it logs to standard out. So the last part is awesome. That part we will keep just like that, because this means that in development, it goes to your terminal, where you can read it. If you use systemd, it gets redirected to syslog which gives you 40 years worth of experience of handling logs. So no reason for you to do it yourself. And if you use a cluster manager like Kubernetes or Nomad, they usually have a, a first class support for streaming those logs, both to your terminal over the network or to log aggregation systems like Logstash. So please do not try to log to files anymore nowadays. And God forbid, do not try to rotate them yourself because you just introduce headaches for people who need to, to run it or maybe change the infrastructure, and that's kind of terrible. So I think it's fair to argue that this application has clear interfaces. We know what's coming in, well, in this case, almost nothing, and we know what's coming out. Now, the goal of the next steps is gonna, is gonna be to add more features to make it more useful, but st still stay as close as possible to this ideal. And First, we will tackle the most glaring problem, which is exposition. Because listening on localhost has like 
two useful use cases. First of all, if you literally just want to communicate over localhost, and secondly, if you have uh, procs in front of it running on the same host like Nginx, which are valid use cases, but we want to be more flexible. So let's, let's shed those shackles and talk about configuration. And here it's important to note the difference between the configuration of your applications and the configuration of general purpose software like uh, Apache or Postfix. Because general purpose, uh, config, general purpose applications need to be flexible and make everyone happy. Your apps need only to make you happy, so you only have to make configurable what matters to you. So you have to ask yourself, what varies? What varies between deployments? What varies between environments? And it turns out that it's very, very little, even for complex applications. So things that do not belong into configuration files are things like your, your HTTP routes, your middleware, or logging. Let's talk about logging for a moment. There are just two things about logging that you need to configure, essentially. The log level, because you want probably more verbose logs on your terminal than you have, <coughs> than you have uh, in production. And the log format. And again, in the log form for log format, there are two things that you care about. You want to have a human-readable version in development and an easily parsable version, something like key value pairs or JSON in production. That's all. So what you do is just you take two configurations, you check them in with your application, and then switch between them just uh, via some configuration we will talk about now. This gives you the possibility to test those configurations with your application, and uh, you do not have to track a different repo that carries your configuration. Um, so. What does belong into configuration, of course, is exposition, so the address and the port you're going to listen on, or external resources like APIs or databases. So once you've identified the few options, how do you pass them into your application? So of course, you could put them into an ini file, which is uh, well supported. The standard library has a config parser, so that's really easy. But um, the problem here is that some of those options need to go into GUnicorn, and some of them options need to go into your application. So you could start parsing any files in your bash script, but I don't think that's a good thing. So if only there were a simple, reliable, and portable way to, to pass key value pairs between processes. Well, there is. It's environment variables. And this is, doesn't only work with our simplistic problem. Injecting files into certain environments can be hard or even impossible. And on the other hand, environment variables are universally supported. So it doesn't matter whether process managers like systemd, um, Docker, or every cluster manager under the sun. And of course, there's a swath of tools for uh, handling environment variables too. Like when you want to create them, direnv is a nice tool that will set environment variables when you enter a directory. Service discovery uh, tools like uh, console or etcd have usually some kind of tools that will uh, read those values out of the services and put them into environment variables. If you want to consume them, every programming language under the sun has a way to access environment variables. For Python, that would be os don environ. And if you really need or really want a file, that's also not a problem. So uh, the oldest solution to that is env subst, which is part of the GetText project, uh, which is for translating um, applications. And it allows you to do simple templating based on environment variables. There's also uh, confd, which supports all kinds of backends, including Redis. And console template, which is the official client for console, if you're using that. So, I would like to stress here that moving from environment variables to files is not a problem. There's a lot of tools that will help you with that. And it's really nice to check in the configuration templates with your application for your testing purposes and just inject the files that vary into the application. So uh, let's talk about uh, our host and our port. So it turns out that people needed this before. And it's so common that there are even standard variables for it, which are called appropriately uh, host and port. 
So we didn't have to change anything to make this work, which is kind of nice. Conventions are great. So if you're writing a generic network uh, application like I do all the time, I also support these uh, variable names because it's really nice. And the aforementioned foreman also will enumerate ports for you. So if you define multiple applications and try to run them, each of them will get a new port so they don't clash and you don't have to manage them by hand. So conventions are great. Try to follow them. Um, the lock level is also easy enough. You can, you just do a little bit of uh, get editor magic on the logging module. How, uh, however, fuzzing around with os.environ is kind of tedious and ugly. And if you're not careful, you sprinkle super global state all over your application. And it wouldn't be me if I gave a talk here at PyCon without plugging another project of mine. So let me introduce you to environ config. I know there are similar projects on PyPI, but at least when I started working on it, none of them does or did what environ config does. And it is declaratively describe the configuration you want to get, including nested classes. And when you try to load this configuration, those names and the prefix are just concatenated using underscores and loaded from the environment. And you just load, uh, you can access them as a normal nested class, the law of Demeter be damned. So since it's best based on adders, and um, I have new stickers, by the way, so if you want adder stickers, come and talk to me. Um, you get a lot of stuff for free. For example, default values, validators, or converters, which are really nice if you want to, for example, convert integers into, into integers. Or if you want to use an enum to limit the value space of a certain configuration option. Now, I like to put this declaration into a file called uh, config.py, but the declaration itself does not load it. Such side effects are, really, are not great. So where do we load it? We could do it in the make app function I showed you before, but it's not great either because make app returns a whiskey app, which I like to use in testing. And having to set up an environment to run tests is not great. So instead, let's create a new file that does all the dirty work and then just passes an instance of app config into your uh, make app function. And I like to call it whiskey.py, and I've seen others call it like that too. And this is how you load the, the configuration. And now this module just became the ultimate interface between your application and the environment. And make app, on the other hand, only deals uh, with a well-known Python class. So you have full control over the app instantiation, and it's really easy to create uh, whiskey apps that have certain properties for your tests. <coughs> and this allows you to have the lowest common denominator on the outside, which is environment variables, key value, and inside, just deal with a validated instance of structured data inside your application, which is really useful and nice. And again, this is not specific to whiskey or to, uh, to web. So you always want to have one very limited interface that interacts with the environment. So for other cases, it could be a CLI entry point, for example. Now you may have noticed <coughs> that um, we now put the whiskey app into a global variable, which uh, mainly is because we have to pass an, an argument. And also, this is more flexible because not all whiskey containers allow for calling functions in the definition. So this, this works with everything. And calling it an application is another convention. And this convention allows us to even shorten, to shorten this uh, line and just pass the name, um, the name of the module. And I forgot to fix it. It should be sample.whiskey, sorry. Um, <coughs> Now, in all the talk about environment variables, there's one thing I left conspicuously out, and that is that time has shown again and again that certain things should not be uh, put into environment variables. Because some things you want to gently whisper into the ear of your application and not make it global to your application process tree. I'm, of course, I'm talking about secrets, passwords, tokens. And there are so many ways that environment variables can leak it happened before, it happened to very smart people, to very big companies, so it will totally happen to you too. And maybe it's just because of some very sm small package that's supposed to do something very different and then it just dumps your environment uh, somewhere. So let me be very clear here. Um, I really want 
wanted you to stop putting sensitive data into environment variables, and I would you, to ask you to ignore the 12-factor app manifesto in this point. I think they are really wrong about this, and I think they're gonna fix it once Heroku grows proper support for secrets. But that's just my opinion. So this is not my pr private opinion. This is uh, quite common now. The problem now is that it gets a bit hairy because the solutions are platform specific. Each platform you may be deploying to has its best way. And you really should use the, uh, the best thing for your platform. And that's all I can tell you. It's, uh, I'll leave it by that. Just giving you a general introduction into the concepts of this is a talk by itself. But lucky for you, this talk does exist. My friend Noah Kantrowitz gave it in 2016, and I will link it in the talk. And for completeness, we run Vault, which is nice because it's vendor independent and open source. So um, you can use it in any case, no matter what platform you use. If you care about secrets and would want to learn more, uh, my other friend Mahmoud has organi is organizing an open space, which is right after this talk in room 10. And we will talk about secrets and um, share experiences. Now, since we are a nomad um, and we are on the vault, I like to use uh, the built-in templating capabilities of it, which means that uh, we render our secrets into a special, a special purpose file system called uh, slash secrets, which is not super great, but it's a decent trade-off. It takes a lot more uh, fails to, to leak a file than an environment variable. Of course, the safest way is platform dependent. And it's also necessary for dynamic secrets. So for example, if you do something only occasionally and the secret may change, you may want to check your secret store before using the secret. So um, what do we do in programming when we want to hide away implementation details? We write a facade. And so I'm gonna suggest that you wrap your secrets client with your own class that will give you an interface and um, then you can choose if you load the secrets on instantiation or um, on use. And if you ch switch backends, you just re-implement it and the, as long as the interface uh, remains the same. And of course, it's also easy to replace with uh, test data. You just implement a fake secret that returns a static string, done. On this slide, I would like to point out that I really like to encode credentials as URLs. A lot of libraries already support it. So the Redis client, for example, has a from URL method. SQL Alchemy does support it. You can pass this right into SQL Alchemy. And there are extensions for Django that allow for that too. I think it's from Kenneth Rice even. So um, the nice thing about this is that it allows you to change more than one thing at once. So uh, if your credentials and your host are in two different spaces, you again have to uh, coordinate the changes. Um, otherwise, you can run into a mismatch between credentials and the host, which is not great. Uh, there's a lot of libraries to parse URLs. Uh, I personally like uh, YARL, which is from the AIO HTTP project, but there are other great ones too. So, where are we now? We have still have a building block that is easy to run. We inject essential information that varies across deployments and environments into the application. Secrets aren't as elegant, but with some effort it's good enough. A little bit magic is always nice. And we expose based on configuration, and we log according to configuration. Now, keen listeners may have noticed that with this approach, it's impossible to reload your configuration. But I would like to reframe that and as, a, as a kind of upside, because it forces you to rethink. And if something changes infrequently enough, like once a day, how about you just redeploy your application? And that leads to another thing that you start uh, thinking about zero downtime deployments very early in the process. And the earlier you start, the more you gain because your develop development and deployment um, <coughs> workflow will be easier from the start. And the farther you get into development, things get harder. It's uh, just how it is. And thanks to having a building block, this is actually very simple to achieve. So instead of one instance of your application, you put two on the same host. And then you put a local load balancer like Nginx in front of it, and which also has a nice down, uh, upside that your app will never ever have to um, listen on a privileged port. So that's a bunch of problems that are right out. And the only 
duty that falls on your app in this setup is that it has to uh, be able to interpret <coughs> um, interpret some metadata that is coming from the load balancer using HTTP headers, so like the client IP. And there is a well-supported header called X forwarded for, and if you use that one, you uh, you probably don't have to do anything except telling your whiskey container to trust that load balancer. There's another one, which is called forwarded, which is actually an RFC, but is sadly not very widely uh, supported. So, for anything else, so again, this is not web-specific. Web um, for example, if you're running HA proxy, they have developed their own proxy protocol that, um, that allows you to pass the exact, the exact same kind of information from a load balancer to the backends. So, we are ready for rolling updates. This is great. You can tell your load balancer to ignore one instance, and now you can do whatever the hell you want. You have no pressure whatsoever. Nobody will know that it's gone, <coughs> and you can shut down your app smoothly uh, as you want. And I would like to uh, take this opportunity to preach a little bit. I want you to make sure that you handle sick term. And it's not super common in uh, Python world, sadly. So sick term is the standard signal sent by all process managers and, uh, yeah, and uh, cluster managers and whatever. And however, unfortunately, uh, some or many frameworks in Python world just wrap the applications into a try except keyboard interrupt block and call it a day. This leads to the worst case that your application ignores a signal and your process manager waits for a timeout and then kills your app with sick kill, which means you cannot do anything about it. That means you get slow, uh, slow shutdowns without cleanups. So that's kind of terrible. But let's assume you did everything right, your application is down, and you can deploy new code however you want, and you can change configuration however you want. And once your application is ready, you just put it back into rotation, and it's like nothing happened. And this way, you leave the act and the complexity of reloading configuration to the load balancer. A load balancer are really good at that. It's like one of the two main tasks they have to, to do really well. And it's another task that just goes from your application to someone else who can do just better. And there's another upside. Let's assume that your deploy does not quite as planned. That happens. So what do you do? Well, you just don't add it back to the load balancer. Simple. And then you take your sweet time on fixing it. So you maybe do a rollback, uh, change the configuration back. And even if you deploy with git pull on a prod server like an animal, <laughs> you, <laughs> you still, I know some of you do it, <laughs> you still uh, get the benefits out of it. So it doesn't matter whether you have a sophisticated cluster schedule from the future or a poor intern with an SSH client. Everyone benefits from that. And nobody will ever know that uh, you screwed up your deployment. Now, there's one thing I hand waved over when I said it's added to load balancing when ready. But how does the load balancer know that you're ready? <coughs> and that's where we have to add another interface. What we need here is introspection. And introspection is a very, very powerful concept, so I'm going to talk a bit of it. <coughs> So what it's about is that you just expose a web endpoint that allows you to reach into your application. And it doesn't matter, again, what type of app you are developing here. Because thanks to the standard library, everyone can expose an HTTP endpoint. You don't even need an external dependency for that. And for load balancing, let's talk about readiness first. The concept of readiness means that your app is ready to serve. It's ready to do what it's supposed to do. It's ready to be added back to the load balancer. <coughs> for that, you expose an endpoint, that once, uh, when it gets a GET request, it will check all resources that it needs to uh, serve your request, and then returns either uh, HTTP 200 when everything is fine, or a 500 if everything is not fine. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's no really clear standard how to call this endpoint, so I'm gonna show you a few. So, uh, some of you may have heard of Google's Health Z, and I've heard multiple legends about why there's a Z. My favorite one is that it's Google Great Security by Obscurity, but it's probably just their standard to avoid uh, clashes. Now, Mozilla has something called Dockerflow, which defines how they do their containers. 
and they use dunders, which is very Pythonic and, and uh, likable. And um, finally, some applications choose to take it literally. So Prometheus exposes a dash ready, and GitLab exposes a dash readiness. I personally really like the dash namespace because it allows you to block this whole namespace in your edge load balancer. So for example, an HA proxy, that's literally one line. And you don't have to worry about it at all. <laughs> now, the downside of this endpoint is that it's quite expensive because you're pinging external uh, resources. For example, if it's a database, you're going to send a select one to it. So you do not want to do it like every second. And sometimes you just want to know whether your application specifically is healthy. So that's when we start talking about liveness. And liveness should be really cheap and just show that your app is alive and it reacts to uh, requests. And this information should be relevant for process and cluster managers, because if this is failing, it means that your app cannot help itself. So it can be either deadlocked and needs to be restarted, or a startup failed, and in that case, it needs to be rolled back. And again, there are multiple common names. Dash healthy is used by uh, Prometheus, which I personally find a bit uh, unfortunate because it's as close as it can be to health Z, which is the opposite. Um, <coughs> and um, yeah, there's a dash liveness from GitLab and Dunder LB heartbeat from Mozilla. The LB starts for uh, load balancer, which I find interesting. So it seems like, I haven't asked specifically, but it seems like Mozilla is using liveness for the load balancers. And I have to admit that I do that too. The reason are multiple, so first of all, this is cheaper, so I can just hammer the app as, far as, uh, as fast as I want. And also, my resources, like database pools, are usually lazy. So my app just works, whether the database is there or not. So my dash ready looks like this. This is straight from production. I just uh, removed a few comments. So no serialization, just quick plain text. Remember, permis uh, remove permissions, because we block this whole namespace anyway and we return an HTTP status 200. And then you add it to your, <coughs> to your um, routes, and you're ready for load balancing. And my pool at this point, when this, is, when this is routed, is fully initialized. So if the database fails, it becomes my task to serve errors. And I can serve better errors than the edge load balancer. It's just going to say um, error 502, no, uh, no backends. So um, all that said, I do have a traditional expensive endpoint, but I use that for monitoring. So with something like Nagios or Prometheus black box export, I just hit it every 15 minutes and uh, see how it behaves. This is a trade-off. Everyone has to make for themselves. One of the reasons I do it is because with Nomad and console, you have only one endpoint. So you have to choose whether you do the one or the other, although you, w you really want to have both. Um, but I just don't want my deployments be rolled back just because someone restarted the database and uh, it's unavailable for a moment. Now, why stop here? Once you have an interface into your application, what else is possible? Like everything, Mozilla has a version endpoint which exposes build information, which can be very useful. Uh, if you like pool-based metrics like I do, Prometheus is wonderful, put it there. Logging. You, maybe you want to get or set your lock level. Maybe your app is misbehaving and you want to know more, but redeploying your application may just uh, go make the problem go away. This is a possibility. You can change the lock level right now. Basically, you can use this for everything that you used Unix signals before and more because you can return useful data. So. Now that we taught our application to talk to load, bal load balancers, it's incredible how much freedom and power we have. Because now we can scale up and down as needed. It's like magic. Your app doesn't need to know how many instances there are. Uh, how about distributing it over multiple servers? Why not? Just in instead of uh, dispatching over port numbers, we dispatch over IP addresses. Um, <coughs> The principle is the same, and they don't even have to be on different servers. You can do this on one host, too, and then have the freedom of moving instances around. So um, at this point, you run into one problem, though. If they're on different servers, they have different file systems. So while you could use some kind of NFS and some locking or, God forbid, Samba, um, 
it's not advisable. So instead, again, let's, let's embrace and rethink, and let's just accept that the file system is Lava now. And one of the classic file system issues is already solved by logging to standard out, because we don't care about the storage. We just send it to standard out, and the environment will uh, provide. So other classics are state, like user sessions. You cannot save your user sessions on the file system of uh, your host, because that would mean that once a user is sent to a different backend, it's, they are locked out, which is not a great experience. So this really means that there's no, no SQLite for you, no files. Instead, learn to love. Postgres for basically everything. Uh, if you want things like caching or user sessions, Redis and Memcache are great. Or if you want dynamic configuration and service discovery, at CD and console are popular. These are your new friends. So when you look at this, uh, you s I see another problem. Because managing this can be a really pain. For very simple um, setups, you can use shell scripts, but you really shouldn't, uh, or Ansible, which is really great, but still it can get very complex very fast. So let's get some help. Did you think it takes me that long until I show you this? <laughs> <laughs> so Docker by itself. Uh, I'm, I was not always the biggest fan, I have to admit that. Uh, but Docker caused an industry packaging standard, or to be fair, like three standards by now, but that's beside the point. And it abstracts away even more application details, which is also really nice. Your black box becomes even blacker. But uh, it also created an ecosystem, and that ecosystem is amazing, because part of the ecosystems are cluster managers. Uh, for those who don't know, top left, Kubernetes, top right, Mises, bottom left, DCOS, bottom right, Nomad. They have all quite different, and depending on how much uh, complexity you can handle, you should choose uh, wisely. <coughs> now, uh, they are a game changer, because once you get them running, and keep them running, uh, you can say, this is my container, and you run it one o on one of these hosts. And this if you have this introspection, you have fully automated deployments in that moment. And all the work to get there is done completely outside your application. You do not have to change anything. Um, and it also means that your applications become ephemeral. So they may have very short lifetimes. They may be shuffled around because your uh, cluster needs to uh, rebalance or something. So there's another reason the file system is Slava. But at this point, your application is ready for a multi-data center cluster without knowing about it. All it knows is how to start and communicate readiness, how to serve and communicate health, and how to stop properly. So it means it became web scale by doing less. So at this point, I could, I could and should start talking about things like service discovery and meshes, which are really great. You should look at Linkerd or Envoy and Istio once, you're, uh, once you have this in prod. But they don't fundamentally change anything about your application. So, uh, and I also don't have enough time. Now, if you wonder, oh my gosh, how do I get my Python into uh, Docker? Another open space by my even other friend, Moshe, which is tomorrow at 11 AM, room 11. I will try to attend uh, if you have any questions about these topics. Um, yeah. Now, let's have a final look at our application. Our app is still a black box. It's still easy to start. Uh, it's self-sufficient in its startup, so if, if your database is not there, it will, it will behave smartly. There are a few varying options configured using environment variables. There's a clean shutdown using a standard signal. It uh, magically retrieves its secrets, and I, I'm going to uh, admit that this is maybe the weakest part, but security is always a trade-off between uh, convenience and security. So this is how it is. <clears throat> now, it also keeps all its data in the external resources and exposes its services as, as configured, where they are picked up by a load balancer, it also exposes its state in a consistent way where uh, other parts of the system can rely on. And the logs still go to standard out where it's picked up by the environment and it's done whatever you want. 
It can be your terminal, it can be Logstash, it can be Fluentd, it can be Graylog. <coughs> now for all of this, our web view hasn't changed at all. I haven't sh showed you since uh, I showed you for the first time. Our application creator now only takes one or two instances of well-known classes. Uh, one with the configuration and one with secrets. Uh, the interaction with the environment is limited to one file only. And the same application works the same way on your notebook, in a platform as a service, or in a cluster. And the heavy lifting is done by decades-old Unix tools or by the bee's knees container orchestrator du jour. So I guess success. One final thought. If we squirm at what we're trying to do here, we want to see our application as a black box with clear interfaces that enable loose coupling with other components so that other components can be replaced at any time. We separate I.O. from logic by logging to standard out and not caring how it's saved, by uh, pushing the configuration from outside and transform it into classes before you start using it in your actual code. And we isolate our process, processes global state into one spot. Well, these are all best practices from software engineering in general. It specifically reminds me of the hexagonal architecture by Alistair Cockburn, who talks about ports and adapters, and it's easy to see how it applies. And other giants like uh, Brandon Rhodes or Gary Bernhardt uh, talk about the same point, so I will link to their talks. Um, I find it very fascinating. So I guess the lesson here is that your app is, or could be in the future, and you should anticipate it, part of something much bigger. So your app boundary should be just under the boundary and sh um, should be treated as such. Um, sadly, as with software architecture, what I've shown you is an ideal. So not every application fits the constraints I've, I've given you. Not every application can run in a cluster. Um, I have plenty of regular applications too that I just deploy using Debian packages, very old school. So, and someone has to write to a disk at some point. I mean, you cannot keep everything in RAM forever. So, and finally, some of what I said conflicts with my advice from last year. <coughs> and neither is wrong. It's just that both are solution to different problems. So you have to break rules at this point. You have to make trade-offs, but you have to know those rules first, and you have to know the consequences. So what I'm trying to say here is that you should come to all of my talks and make informed decisions. <laughs> mm. One more thing. Don't we all crave realistic examples? Wouldn't we love it like big companies would show us how they deploy their, uh, their applications? We do. But they, they will not do that, at least not concretely. If you ask them, they will use buzzwords and tell you about continuous deployment and chat ops and whatnot. But in reality, it's probably a bunch of shell scripts written in 2002 by someone who's not in the company anymore and everybody's just uh, afraid to touch it. <coughs> But it turns out that we have one great open source example of a modern uh, web application that I love coming back to and where I learned a lot too. And of course, it's the new PyPI. The new PyPI serves over 6 billion requests per month, which amounts to 1.5 petabyte of data. And it does so super fast. And everything you want to know about it is in GitHub. You just have to. Uh, you can, you can look how they do things, and I found it very enlightening. Uh, except for the secrets. It's not great how they do that, but uh, nobody's perfect. Um, I mean, if you're unhappy with something, um, the final push has been done on a grant from Mozilla, and the grant is used up. So I would suggest to, uh, if you want to PyPI further to improve, to donate and um, help it to improve even further. Now, that's all I have for you today. Um, please check out the talk page, follow me on Twitter, and get your domains from Vario Media if you speak German. I'm Hinek, thank you very much.